Uh, so welcome to uh, the special lecture of the Haki Vienna International Science School. Uh, it's my very, very great uh, pleasure uh, and honor to introduce to you uh, our speaker today, uh, Günther Ziegler. Uh, Günther is um, a, a great uh, role model uh, for me, as a matter of fact. Uh, he's an uh, amazing mathematician. Uh, and he is uh, just as amazing uh, a person. Uh, Günther is, um, uh, uh, his, his many different roles uh, that uh, you might know him for. Uh, many of you, I imagine, uh, have come across his uh, book um, with, with his colleague Martin Eigner, Proofs from the Book, uh, a collection of um, um, proofs that are so, uh, beautiful and so uh, inspiring uh, that uh, uh, they ought to be recorded uh, for um, uh, uh, for all times to come. Uh, Günther uh, is also president of the Free University uh, in Berlin uh, and, um, and a terrific citizen of mathematics uh, all around. Uh, Günther, uh, it's an honor to have you, and we really look forward uh, to your talk, Canons at Sparrows. Yeah, thanks, Michael. Um, in in fact, it's it's something special for me, and it's great, and it's an honor to be here and to uh, speak in the Kharkiv uh, Vienna Science School. And uh, me coming from Freie Universität and from Berlin, Germany, of course, puts me also into a special role. And uh, I'm happy to have the chance to present to you some of my mathematics. Um, I will try and share um, a screen, um, which would, now I have to, find it and again this jumped to a completely wrong page um let me try and um um go to the beginning of the lecture to start out with um and um which is called oh this moves too quickly and somehow it seems to move automatically which i really cannot accept um, we will see. So the lecture is called Canons at Sparrows. Um, it's a metaphor that's very well known in German to shoot with canons at sparrows, which means you use much too big tools to solve really small problems. And I will try and show you a big mathematical instance um, of that, um, which is exciting for me also because this is a beautiful story that connects quite different parts of mathematics. Um, a lot of it can be illustrated in, in, in pictures, and I will try to do exactly that and to give you an impression of what's happening, um, even if um, perhaps a lot of the details might be too technical to understand them in a one-hour lecture. I was also asked to make a break at some points. I might suggest situations where I do that um let me uh, try that um, but if i forget please remind me if it's a good time to have a break so here is the plan i will first talk about the sparrow a little problem then about the tools we use i will try and give you some details they might be technical so i will only give you um mostly pictures i believe that that's a good way also to explain also very complicated mathematics. Um, and oops, so again, I think I will stop the screen sharing and um, try it again, but with not with Acrobat, but with this. And perhaps that will not move automatically and drive me crazy while talking. Okay. Um, I was just trying to explain that um, um, that plan, and I hope that you are all happy with uh, us together going along that plan. Now, I see only, I think, five or six faces here, but I see a certain amount of happiness. That's what I want to see, that you are happy 
with the plan we are having and also that you that you interrupt me anytime needed i think the rule said if you have questions um put them into the chat but um also i'll be happy to respond anytime i'm asked to so we start with the sparrow the sparrow is um in this case not a little birdie but indeed a little problem and this is the place where this problem originally occurred um so i don't know whether you can uh, read the fine print this is a problem from september 28 2006 um on the blog of an indian mathematician so it's wonderful that there's also students from india here today uh, are nanda kumar who together with his fr uh, friend ramana rao presents another geometric problem that they have cooked up. It says you're given a convex shape. So think of a pentagon and a positive integer. Let's say, well, take your favorite one, but I would suggest you take six. And the claim is that for every such shape and for every integer, there exists some way to cut this shape into n convex pieces so that all pieces have equal area and equal perimeter. That's the problem. We will look at examples. Um, you might at the first glance think that this should be easy and that's what many people thought. Um, um, we will also see where the difficulties is. Um, Nanda Kumar here writes about similar problems that, that have been looked at and solved. And at the end of this blog entry, he says, uh, despite that there were related results, um, if you would take only equal part of the outer boundary instead of perimeter, it is easier. And he notes at that case already that if you solve this problem, so if you cut a pentagon into six pieces of equal area, of course, it's clear what the area is. But if the pieces have the same, supposed to have the same perimeter, it's not clear what the perimeter is. So this was posted by R. Nanda Kumar on what was it, um, the 28th of September 2006, so 17 years ago, um, at 6.57 in the morning. So you see that at least some mathematicians are either early risers or he worked on this all night and only went to bed very late. We don't know. We could ask him. So that's the problem we want to solve. And at the end of this lecture, I will tell you how close we are to solving it. It is not quite done. So it also means it's a challenge for, for you if you want to try. Now, Nanda Kumar, two years later, and Ramana Rao presented their first paper on this, which also was revised, if you think. They called this a fair partition of polygons. And this paper gives an, gives an introduction and shows why the answer is yes for n equals 2 for cutting into two pieces. We'll do this in a second. They say they indicate that the answer should also be yes for three pieces, but they can't quite do it. And they say why, why the same scheme doesn't work for n equals four and eight and 16. Um, mostly it's uh, describing difficulties. So what can we see from that? Um, Nanda Kumar has worked on the problem um, together with Ramana Rao and they couldn't quite do it. So. If people have worked on it for a while and couldn't do it, it means it's an interesting problem. So let's do examples, right? Here is a convex polygon, a square. You're supposed to cut that into two pieces of equal area and equal perimeter. Um, for a square, this is really easy. Um, and indeed, any line through the center cuts this into two convex pieces um, of equal area and of equal perimeter just by symmetry. Does everybody understand what a convex polygon is and what a partition is supposed to be? Um, I hope that everybody's happy up to that. 
Now, um, it already gets a bit harder if we take a triangle or half a square and try and cut this into two pieces of equal area. Now, this is one way to cut into a piece of equal area. And of course, um, we realize it is easy to cut any polygon into n pieces of equal area. You can just do that by vertical lines. And so there's no problem at all, but the pieces in general will have different perimeter and they're supposed to have equal perimeter. So this again does not solve the problem. If this is two pieces of equal area, they don't have the same perimeter. For this example, actually it turns out to be easy again because there's a symmetry, right? So this is cutting into two pieces of equal area. What do we do if we have a general convex polygon? Try and cut this into two pieces of equal area and equal perimeter. And I'm sure if I would give you 10 minutes to think about that, or even less, then you would come up with an answer. And that would also be a correct answer and one that works. But since we are trying to speed up, um, Here's what you could do. First, cut this into two pieces of equal area, vertical line that does it. And now what we do is we rotate the line. And actually there's different ways to do it. I suggested we rotate the line such that at every point um, you have equal area on both sides. Right? Now, um, there's a few things to check. Uh, one way to uh, one thing to check is that this is well defined. So at ev every slope, there's exactly one way to do it that you get equal area on both sides. You also have to check that if you rotate that line in such a way that the perimeter changes continuously, it will change, but it changes continuously without jumps. And now if you rotate that way and always keep same area um, on to the left and to the right, then if you rotate by 180 degrees, then suddenly you have interchanged left and right. And if in the beginning, the perimeter was larger on the right, then in the end, after 180 degrees, the perimeter will be larger on the left. And so if it was first larger on the right and then larger on the left, then it must have been zero somewhere in between. The difference must have been zero, right? So we just look at the difference of areas. If you want, that's a continuous function while the line moves. And if the function is positive in the beginning and negative in the end, then it must have been zero in between if the function was continuous. So that's what people in calculus call the intermediate value theorem. So it's a theorem from calculus that one learns in advanced high school. But even if not, this is a rather intuitive thing that if a function is continuous and if it changes from plus to minus, then it has to be zero in between. However, we've done something else. We've not only sort of quoted a bit of calculus, we've also quoted a bit of topology because continuous functions is a question of topology, also to define things to be continuous. And here we have looked at a configuration space. Namely, if you want to partition a polygon into two pieces of equal area, two convex pieces, then we've seen that you do that by cutting by a line. And the only parameter we have is the slope of the line. And the space of all possible configurations is a circle. Because if you rotate by 180 degrees, you arrive at the same, um, at the same partition. And so the configuration space of equal area part two partitions which is partitions into two spaces is a circle. Now, um, I hope that everybody is still happy with this description.
but I know that we've uh, jumped a lot ahead because we've used calculus, we've used topology, we've introduced the concept of a configuration space, which is the space in the sense of a topological space, if you want to make that formal, of all possible configurations of a certain type. And here the configurations are the partitions of, um, of a convex polygon into two convex pieces of equal area. That's what this problem says we should look at. And actually on the way, we've solved the problem for n equals two. The intermediate value theorem told us that there is a value where the difference is zero. So where the two pieces have equal area. End of proof, fill in the details, write it up. So a fair partition into two pieces exists by the intermediate value theorem from calculus. So we did it for n equals two, now we have to do it for n equals three. Um, for n equals three, I can tell you that this has been solved in a paper by three authors in Advances in Mathematics, which is a top research journal. So this was quite an achievement to solve the problem for n equals three. We will do that on the way in the course of this lecture. So um, how do you find a partition into three pieces with equal area and equal perimeter? So a partition like that could look like this. And actually, again, the symmetry helps for this example to find this. But we want to partition general polygons where we don't have the partition. And it turns out um, there doesn't seem to be a really simple elementary solution, even for n equals three. Let's say you take a pentagon. Why can you really cut it into three pieces of equal area and equal perimeter? Not so clear. So let's look at the canons. So what we want to look at is the, again, the configuration space of equal area partitions into three pieces. And it turns out that the partition of a polygon into three pieces, three convex pieces, either it looks like what we've just looked at, or it looks like um, um, you cut by two lines that don't meet in the polygon, but perhaps meet in, in, at infinity if they're parallel or something like that. So indeed, you can think of any such partition is generated by three lines, but sometimes it's not clear where the third lines is. So the configuration space is already complicated. Even more so if we ask, what does the configuration space of equal area partitions into n pieces look like? This can be defined as a topological space. So you can say, when are two partitions close to each other? But to describe it um, is complicated. And now it turns out that we can look at and take the first canon that's really needed. And we will use tools from a theory that's called optimal transport. Now, if we don't know what that is, um, we look at Wikipedia, and that describes transportation theory as a mathematical theory that goes back to 1781. So this is um, very classical. A guy called Tolstoy worked on it. That's not the novelist. And then a guy called Kantorovich worked on it and proved the central theory, and uh, that's an economist who actually later got a Nobel Prize. So he's um, definitely important. And there's what's known as the Monge Kantorovich transportation problem. Um, if you want to really look up um, what it is, sort of modern version, here's a book by, a thick book by Cedric Villani, the Fields Medalist which explains um, optimal transport and of course also contains that theorem. I can tell you this book is um, rather hard to access, um, but perhaps also only for me because this is really an analysis book and 
that's not really my favorite and strongest corner of mathemat uh, mathematics. But optimal transport, what I wanted to show with this book, is also a big area of current research where famous people like Villani have worked substantially. Now, here's the theorem. And this is first uh, the version in words going back to Kantorovich, 1938. Um, it says that if you take any n distinct points in the plane, think of three points or six points, then there's unique weights that you can give to the points such that the weighted Voronoi diagram partitions the polygon into n pieces of the same area. So that's true for every n. So that means basically, if you want to have an equal area partition, you can get that from n distinct points. And more so, this partition changes continuously with the points. So that's what we need. So this means that a certain configuration space which we will talk about, the configuration space of n distinct points in the plane parameterizes weighted Voronoi partitions into n convex pieces. Now, um, there's one or two details missing in what I'm giving here. Uh, for example, the weights are not, not really unique. Um, you can add a constant to all of them. And also, I haven't described what a weighted Voronoi diagram is, and I don't want to do that technically, but I want to give you pictures for that. So again, here is um, a polygon. Here is three distinct points in the polygon. And now if you do a Voronoi diagram, then you would partition the triangle by which points are close uh, or which point orange points are closest to which of the three white points. And so this gives you the Voronoi cell of, um, let's see, of the three points. Now, this is already not the Voronoi diagram, but a weighted Voronoi diagram because you see that the area that belongs to the top point is much larger than, than the others. And weighted Voronoi diagram just means that you look at closest to the white points and measure that not by distance, but by distance squared minus the weight of the point. And that's the formula which generates a structure like this. And it turns out that if you give the white points the right weights, then you will get a partition into three pieces of equal area. Or if you put n equals six, then take any six white points, you will get a partition into weighted Voronoi cells of equal area. Now, if you take a different configuration of points, then this equal area partition might also have equal perimeter. I assume it's not quite clear where this will lead us, why this would help us to really find a partition of equal area of perimeter, but this helps us to understand the space of all partitions. And then we have to do something on the space of all partitions. Now, here comes a side remark. This is a cover of from the Mathematical Intelligencer a few years ago. And this was from a paper by Peter Gritzmann from Munich, where he explained how optimal transport and these partitions that you can get from the Monge Kantorovich theorem and from weighted Voronoi partitions why this is important and practical and useful. And um, that might tell us that what we are looking at in the moment is actually applied mathematics, because we are talking about a part of mathematics here, this transport theory and weighted Voronoi diagrams, which comes from economics. Kontorovich was a mathematical economist and which is useful in practice. So this is applied mathematics. 
And this is where I wanted to do a side remark where I would say that these categories and trying to put math into categories like pure mathematics and applied mathematics just don't work, right? And in the end, the purest type of mathematics you might think about in the end is useful on some practical problems that can't be excluded. Um, and indeed, it's always mathematics is one thing that's subdivided into many different fields and areas and directions and problems, but to divide between pure and applied mathematics doesn't make sense. And even um, we, we know that people like G.H. Hardy, the number theorist, argued that his type of mathematics, namely number theory, was never um, useful for anything practical. And this was important to him because he wrote this in war times in the Second World War. And of course, even that wasn't true because number theory is in coding theory. Um, mathematics is in technology. Um, of course, I'm making these comments in war times again. Um, going back to mathematics, we shouldn't divide between pure and applied mathematics. Also, we shouldn't, um, people talk about recreational mathematics and put that down and say, you know, if it's fun and people play with it, it can't be serious. And my lecture is supposed to give you an example of how that is wrong. Of course, this problem about partitioning polygons is from recreational mathematics, but we'll do some really serious stuff with it. There's also what call com people call computer science, which in my understanding is a part of mathematics. Actually, what people call theoretical computer science, algorithms and so on, complexity, this is all mathematics and doesn't need a separate name. There's pe what people call operations research. That's what they call econom uh, economics, if it's mathematical. Um, it's all just mathematics and mathematics is a huge area with many different aspects. It has lots of applications, good and some bad in real life, but it's, it's important structure and important technology. That's why we should study it. And also, of course, there's theories in there. That's the special thing about mathematics and good theories are the ones with which you can do something and good problems, to my extent, uh, understanding, are problems that motivate you to do something interesting with. And that's also the problems where some theories can be applied. So this is parts of mathematics. It's all one thing. End of that comment. Should I just interrupt briefly? Otherwise, uh, next I would go into the second part of canons. So Cannon's part one was uh, this optimal transport that we will use to say that from every configuration of n points in the plane, distinct points, we can get a partition into n pieces of equal area by this Voronoi construction. Are there any questions from the audience at this point? Hunt, I think we are good to continue. Okay, wonderful. Let's go. Second uh, use of canons comes from, I must say, one of my favorite math books. It's a real book. But there was a question before that, perhaps before I go into this. Uh, um, I yes. see that David Buchmeier Boffel raised his <laughs> hand. Yeah, I wanted to ask um, that, I mean, I don't think like um the different if you choose different points they still can give you the same Voronoi diagram Voronoi diagram if you weight them correctly right um, like the three points on a line for example yeah if you put uh, one point farther away you can still choose the weight so that the line is equal and then the configuration space is different or isn't it so um i could try and go Wait. back to this picture with the uh, if we just look at this, exactly. so if you take these points and look at the Voronoi diagram, the Voronoi diagram will just be the horizontal two horizontal lines, um, which are just in the middle in there, right? Mm -hmm. 
Now, if you move the points a bit to the right, yeah, we'll get the same Voronoi diagram. Right? So in that mm -hmm. sense, the same configuration of points will give you the same Voronoi diagram. Um, the ones that we are interested in are the weighted Voronoi diagrams that give you equal area partitions. Mm -hmm. But if you move these points a bit up or a bit to the right, then they will give you also the same equal area partition. So it's not one-to-one. -one. Um, different point configurations will give you the same equal area partition. Yeah. But like uh, we are using this to, to study the, um, the configuration space. So yeah. it's not the same space as um, the space of n different points in the plane, right? So I will take the the space of n different indeed labeled points in this in the plane so i will call them points one two three mm -hmm. and that's the space we use because that's very classical and very well studied um, in this problem as you observe um, we could divide out translations because they don't matter so different configurations give the same partition but that's um that's not important here, and it's easier if we if we just stay with the classical object. Okay. We'll see. Yeah, I just it confused me, but thank you for the answer. All right. Okay. Fine. <laughs> okay. Now um, the canons. I wanted to go into. So this is the book we use. It's a beautiful book by Jirka Matuszek from Prague, um, which I highly recommend uh, if you want to get a bit more into the stuff I'm doing in this lecture using topological tools for geometric problems. This is a beautiful problem um, book that explains um, all the basic theory and how you can use the borsuk ulam theorem um, um, on these problems. Um, Jirka Matuszek was a Actually, I think he called himself a computer scientist, but a wonderful mathematician from Prague. He died much too early a few years ago from cancer, um, but he's one of my heroes. Um, Borsuk and Ulam are, um, if you want, Polish topologists who, um, who started their careers in Lviv at the Scottish Cafe. Uh, a city that was then called Lemberg and part of Poland, which is now in Ukraine. Um, and U Lviv in Ukraine is a place where a lot of topology started as a, as a, um, as a science and as a theory. So this is a little pointer to Western Ukraine. Um, this book is very essential. This is an ad, an ad I found for a copy of this book uh, some years ago. I don't know whether you can read what's written in blue up here. Um, this book is in the category of ch children and youth literature in this subsection fun and games and in the subsection knowledge for children. So, um, I think uh, highly recommended, but not yet uh, knowledge for children, but a very recommended book. Um, it's a book that gets you beautifully into this, how to use topology to solve problems with the borsuk ulam theorem. It turns out for our lecture, the borsuk ulam theorem is not good enough because the borsuk ulam theorem does everything that you can do for n equals two and we will need the general case. And the general case um, you can read in a book by Tamo Tom Dieck, a German mathematician from Göttingen on transformation groups. And that has a chapter where he explains equivariant, uh, equivariant obstruction theory. That's a very specialized topological theory. And it turns out that's what we need for this uh, sparrow problem. Here is page 115 from this book, theorem 3.10. And it says that there's an exact obstruction sequence uh, that does something. You see this beautiful type of notation that topologists have cooked up over decades. 
And of course, we are not going to do the full theory for any of this in the moment, but I will show you that in pictures, that this can be shown and illustrated in pictures, and then it does something concrete and does something very concrete for our problem. Let me try and do that in some, some details. So the type of stuff that, um, that um, Tom Deke is writing down there, we are always writing down spaces. So that's geometric topological spaces. And in what I wrote down here, the S of WN is a certain sphere, a higher dimensional sphere turns out. And EAP is the configuration space of all partitions of a polygon P into N convex parts of equal area. So what I'm doing now is I'm taking this general theory, which I've shown you briefly, but won't explain. And now we are looking at a very concrete situation of that. And I believe that even Tamo Tom Deek has never seen such a concrete situation for his theory, because he's one of these topologists who write up and understand and explain the general theory, but they never sort of compute a specific instance. Here we go. So EAP of PN is the space of all equal area partitions of a polygon P into N convex pieces, everything labeled. And this is a space of configurations. It's very complicated. A uh, doctoral student of mine from Colombia worked really hard to understand this a bit. Um, complicated space, a mess. Don't go into it. This thing here on the right is, is easier. That's a sphere. And actually this does, if you're in n-dimensional geometry, then we are looking at n-dimensional space, but we are looking at the hyperplane where the sum of the coordinates equals zero that reduces the dimension by one. So if you think of three-dimensional space, then this is for n equals three, then this is a two-dimensional plane. And in this two-dimensional plane, we look at all the vectors of length one. And this turns out to be a sphere of dimension n minus two. So if we have n equals three, this is just a circle. And now the fact is that from there is a map from the space of partitions to the sphere. And you get this map by taking the perimeters of the pieces of equal area. You subtract the average, which puts them to, um, to equal, um, sorry, which, which gives you a, a number, which gives you a sequence of values of some zero. That's the point, right? If you take any values and you subtract the average, and after doing that, the average is zero. And then you normalize, which means you divide by the length of your vector and you get a vector of length one. And the point I'm having is that we get a map from this space of equal area partitions to the sphere under the assumption that these equal area partitions, there isn't one that has all perimeters equal because if all perimeters are equal, then the average is zero and we divide by zero, right? So the whole point here is we are not dividing by zero. That's where we are getting. And here's the last piece of the game. Um, everything is what the topologists call equivariant. That just means that if you permute your points in the plane or if you permute the equal area parts, then you also permute their perimeters and you also permute them perimeters minus average and that means you permute the coordinates of the points in the sphere so you really get not only a map of topological spaces here but you get a map that um, fits together with permuting um, if we work this out um, on the in the end um, the this is just permuting coordinates and permuting columns um, if we go into matrices. Now, 
This is what I'm starting to do here is to set up what Matoshek in this little children's book calls the configuration space test map scheme. Um, and that's a beautiful way to solve various problems in such a way. And Matoshek is the one who has really explained how this works and how it can be done. Now, this is the technical part of the lecture. I'll do it in pictures in a section. Here we now write down this f of r to n is the space of n points in the plane. You can think of n points in the plane as given as a matrix of length two by n, where um, what we assume is that these n points are distinct, which in particular means that the two that no two columns are equal, and that basically defines the space. The space is all and the space of all matrices of size two by n, where no two columns are equal. Um, that's a beautiful space. And it turns out this space has been studied again and again and again. The earliest paper I know is in by Fox and Neubert, 1962. So it's more than 60 years old. And uh, all kinds of people, also very famous people, have worked on this. Um, it's a space that is very well understood basically because it's the complement of a subspace arrangement. And so you can use technology from hyperplane arrangements and from discrete geometry to understand it. So it's a well understood space. And why do we have a map? We have a map from this space of discrete and distinct points to the space of equal area partitions exactly because of the mons kantorovich theorem. And the map just takes n points and maps that to the weighted Voronoi diagram that has equal areas. Um, so we have a map and indeed it's an equivariant map. If I exchange the points in the plane, then this will exchange the pieces in the equal area partition. And in the end, if I map further, this exchanges the, uh, the coordinates of the points in the sphere. So again, this ansatz here is quite natural in the configuration space test map scheme and has been um, promoted by Karasov, Hubbard and Aronoff uh, 2013. Now here's the last piece we need. It turns out this configuration space FR2N is not good for us because, um, because it's the largest part of R to the N. And in order to use this theory, we need a cell complex. We need something that the topologists call compact. It's something that you can, um, can work with and do combinatorics with. And um, part of the work here is to really construct a combinatorial model for this configuration space. And that's what we did. And I will show you this in, by, in examples and in pictures. I think it's never been worked out in the type of details and as explicitly as I will show you now, uh, although in general, everything that goes into that is very classical. But so the cell complex model for the configuration space, it again goes back to um, Fox and Neuwert and more than 60 years. The technology I will show you um, is in a paper by Anders Bjorner, who was my doctoral advisor, myself, 1992, uh, again, um, 30 years ago. Now, what we do is that this F2N is something that sits in the configuration space. We do have a map. The map is equivariant, which just means everything fits together on top of the Now, end of the um, sort of abstract part, the summary is the following. If for some n, think of n equals whatever you want, three or six or 12, and for some polygon, think of a pentagon, if there's no equal area partition into n parts with equal parameters. So that says if there's any counter example to this conjecture or to this problem, then there is an equivariant map from the cell complex F2N to the sphere 
that I've described of all coordinates in n space, uh, all vectors in n space of length one and sum of coordinates zero. So there must be an equivariant map. So the goal will be that such a map doesn't exist. And if the map doesn't exist and there's no counterexample to the problem, then we've solved the problem. That's the idea. And as you've seen, um, there's lots of topology in this situation. And the point is that equivariant obstruction theory, which you can learn from this blue book from Tom Deke, can be used to decide whether such a map exists. All right. Now let's start it. This was the general thing. Let's start at n equals three. If for n equals three and for some polygon, there's no equal area partition into three parts of with equal parameters, then there is a S3 equivariant map. So that's the permutation group of three, three points to actually the one sphere. That's a very concrete situation that we can visualize. And here's what that looks like. If you work out the details, on the left side, we get the cell complex model for this configuration space of three points in the plane. And this picture you are supposed to interpret as this, these six nodes. I don't know whether you can see my mouse, my cursor here. Yes. So here's one point. Here's the second, three, four, five, six. And these points um, are the six nodes of the cell complex. And basically, they correspond to cell to point configurations where like this one here on the top corresponds to point one being left of the point two, and that's one's left of the point three. So that's sort of the general situation. The cell complex consists of these six points. And then we glue in 12 edges, which you can think of really as, as rubber bands being glued in. So that's a graph with six vertices and 12 edges. And everything's always labeled by, um, by combinatorial objects that I won't explain in detail. And now our configuration space or the cell complex model also has six two-dimensional, basically hexagons glued into this thing. Here's one that would be the hexagon that basically corresponds to the three points being on a vertical line in order one, two, three. And there's a second hexagon that you glue in like this, and a third one like this, and a fourth one, and a fifth one, and a sixth one. So the space we have consists of six vertices and these 12 edges, and then these six glued in triangles. And the question is, can you map this thing to a circle? And the circle is really the circle of all points in three space with sum of coordinates equals one and, um, and um, sum of the square, sorry, sum of the uh, coordinates equals zero and sum of the squares equals one. Now we are supposed to map this over. Can you map this space to the circle. And it turns out that, of course, you can map the vertices and you can map the edges. But the question is, can you map the, the hexagons? And for example, you could try and map the, the first hexagon over like this. But then as, the, as you have to also map the interior of the hexagon to the circle, if the boundary is mapped like this, you can do it. So what do you do? You try and modify the map. If this, um, if this chain in yellow I map over like this, then I can also map the interior of the hexagon in a continuous way to the circle. However, it's supposed to be equivariant. And that means it has to fit together with permuting the points. And that means if the first one you modify like this, then you also have map over this second edge and have to rather map it like this. And then you also have to map the third one. 
So you have to work out what does it mean to be equivariant. And it means that if you modify your map in some way, then there's other modifications which are also, um, also forced. Now, what we try and do is we, we try, oops, again, this is moving too fast. We try and map this whole cell complex in the left to the circle, and we try and modify the map of the vertices and edges, in particular the edges, in such a way that the hexacons can be glued in. Details to be worked out. It turns out that in the end, um, we can try and do this, but we will not succeed because what comes out of this whole game and of analyzing the situation is that this map exists from the cell complex on the left, this two-dimensional cell complex to the circle, if and only if there's a solution to this equation. Why is this so? Well, this is so because Basically, if you look here at the yellow and white stuff on the right side of the picture, then you can glue in the hexagon without using the center, if and only if the winding number of what happens there is zero, right? And for the original map, um, the winding number was one. And then we've modified the, the map, but every modification forced to others, and which means it always goes in threes. And this means that this map exists if and only if there's a solution to this equation, which says I take the original version, I modify one edge, and I always have to take triples together and then modify the other two and three edges. And in the end, I want to get zero. So the question is, is there a solution to this equation? And in particular, it says that this map does not exist if there's no solution to this equation. Question, does this equation have a solution in integers? Now, I want to hear an answer. Michael, I think everybody should see that. Uh, yeah, I, I agree. Uh, Constantine, will you uh, briefly explain? Yeah, you could look at it in mod three and then understand okay. that uh, the left side is not congruent to the right side. Yeah, uh, exactly. Beautiful. Um, the On the left side, actually, it's, it's congruent to one mod three and the right side is um, is divisible by three or yeah, left side is not divisible by three, but the right side is. So there's no solution to this equation, which means there is no map, no equivariant map from the configuration space to the sphere, which means there's no counterexample to the problem for n equals three. We've solved this problem for n equals three. As I said, this was an advances paper um, by three authors uh, a few years ago. Okay, let's do it for n equals four. If we do this for n equals four, then on the left side, we have actually a three-dimensional cell complex, which has um, 24 vertices and a large number of edges, and then um, a certain number of two-dimensional cells, which come in squares and in hexagons, and then there will be 24 um um again cells that we want to glue in there so i don't know whether everyone around has seen the permutahedron this is one and this matches the combinatorics of the permutation group of four on four letters and um the it's now important that the faces of the permutahedron come in these different types and actually the permutahedron has four hexagon faces and it has six square faces, and it has another four hexagon faces. Um, four plus six plus four is 14. I said it's 24, that was wrong. 14 was correct. Um, we have these 14 
cells on the left side and they come in groups of four and six and four. And we try and move, map this over to the two sphere. And now it's basically the same game as before, but one dimension up. And the geometry, of course, and the cell complex becomes more complicated to work out. But in the end, it boils down to an equation. And it says that this map from the model for the configuration space to the two sphere exists if and only if there's a solution to this equation. And um, now there's two problems. And one question is, what is this equation? And the second one is, does it have a solution? Now, first, what is this equation? So this pattern of one, four, six, four comes from looking at the cells of the permutahedron. But what is this? Now, not everybody's shouting out, out because the mics are, yes, Shihan? It seems like the um, fourth row of Pascal's triangle. It's the fourth row of Pascal's triangle. Um, this may be a coincidence, but um, we had before, we had looked at this equation, and that's the third row of Pascal's triangle, right? One, three, three. So actually, yes, this is true, and it is not a coincidence. Um, perhaps you can also immediately tell me whether this equation has a solution in integers. It doesn't, because, yeah. Why not? Because um, if we put the 4x1 plus 6x2 plus 4x3 on the other side, and one side is even, the other side is odd. Yes. There's various ways to say that, but uh, we can look at it more too. The left-hand side is clearly odd. The right-hand side is very even. So there's no solution, right? And this means up there, there's no map, which means we've just solved the problem for n equals four, right? Every polygon has a partition into four um, convex um, pieces of equal area and equal, uh, um, equal perimeter. And now we continue. And it turns out that the same scheme tells us that this map from the cell complex to the sphere does not exist if and only if there's no solution um, to the same type of equation with the nth row of Pascal's triangle. So the question is, um, is it true that this equation never has a solution? Then we are done. And if it's not quite that obvious, then when does it have a solution? And now this is where the queen comes in. Um, according to Gauss, again from Göttingen, um, um, mathematics is the queen of the sciences and number theory is the queen of mathematics. And he says she often condescends to render service to astronomy and other natural sciences, but in all relations, she's entitled to the first rank. So this goes back to the question of applied mathematics and astronomy and these things. We are not going there. This is the point where we need number theory because we want to have a result about um, certain equations having solutions in integers. And it turns out, and now, again, I had to search for that for a while and I needed help. Now we go back to where the problem came from, namely to India. A guy called Balagram about whom I know nothing except he was in Madras at the times that Ramanujan was there. And this is a theorem from the uh, first volume of the Madras Mathematical Journal. And it says that exactly this solution, this equation, which we just looked at, has no solution in the integers. That is 
Um, and that's already something to prove. That's, that's if the nth row of Pascal's triangle has a common factor, right? By the nth row of Pascal's triangle, of course, I ignore the one, right? It's uh, the interior values. And this has a common factor for, as we saw, two, three, and four. And he proved that this is if and only if n is a power of a prime. Right. So here's Pascal's triangle. And actually, this is a drawing of, um, uh, of Pascal's triangle from another kid's book that I was quoting uh, already, namely The Number Devil by Enzensberger, the German poet and author. And we're actually on the next page of the book. He gives this picture and shows us row six. And the question is basically, is there a common factor in 6, 15, and 20? And there isn't. I see shaking heads. And indeed, this means that the equation 1 plus 6x1 plus 15x2 plus 20x3 and so on equals 0 has a solution. Indeed, it does. Right? You can work it out. Does anyone see the solution or one solution? I don't have it on a slide, so I need it. One plus six X one plus 10 X two, sorry, no, 15 X two plus 20 X three. We can do it like that equals zero. Um, where is the solution? Anyone see that? Um, yes, Ezra? Um, so zero, zero, uh, one, negative one, negative one should work because 15 and six is 21. So then that yes, would be exactly. Wonderful, we didn't see you, but we saw your hand. Um, so indeed, um, uh, one minus six minus 15 plus 20 equals zero. So this thing has a solution. So the equation has a solution, which means also this continuous equivariant map exists, which means we haven't solved the problem for, um, n equals six. But we have solved the problem for n equals 7 and n equals 8 and n equals 9, because 7 and 8 and 9 are prime powers. Right? So here's a theorem that we have. And that's the, the Nanda Kumar Ramana Rao problem for prime powers. It says if n is a prime power, then each polygon has a fair partition into n parts. Fair meaning equal area, equal perimeter. And we have proved that. And if n is not a prime power, because obstruction theory is an if and only if thing, then it says that there is an equivariant continuous map from this configuration space to the sphere. Now, this does not mean that the problem is wrong for n equals 6 or 10 or 12. But it says that we haven't proved it for n equals 6 or 10 or 12. And however, one can make this into an if and only if theorem were for a different problem. Namely, if I would not have the perimeter function, but some suitable other functions, then indeed we would give get an if and only if theorem. I will not um, go into details of that. I think um, I'll be happy to discuss that afterwards or um, look with you at the paper where we, where we discuss this, but it does not solve the original problem if we don't have a prime power. So that's basically the main part at the end of the main part of my lecture. I have a few more comments. Perhaps I'll just go into them and then we go into discussion. So first there's this um, this um, 
poem by Hans Magnus Enzensberger that was also quoted in the abstract. Um, the English translation, it's of course, it's a poem in German by Hans Magnus Enzensberger, who's a great German author and poet. Uh, so I got pretty dark here in Berlin already and on my desk, but I'm still here. Um, um, Hans Magnus Enzensberger died last year. Um, but he's left us lots of things. He's, he's left us The Number Devil, which is a children's book uh, about mathematics, which I recommend, which exists in a huge number of languages. He left us a lot of essays and he left us poems. And this is this poem about um, sparrows at cannons, where he says that on occasion I've shot sparrows at cannons. There was no bull's eye in that, which I understand. And in the end, he says, cannons at sparrows, that would be to lapse into the inverse error. Somewhere in the middle, he talks about um, 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 about the well-known discussion about trees. And that goes back into the history of poetry in German, where Brecht claimed in the poem that this is awful times we're talking about trees already ignores all the bad things in the world. Not our topic here. I wanted to show you some mathematics where we really shoot with cannons at sparrows. The sparrow in this case is, um, is recreational mathematics, this little problem about partitioning a polygon into n pieces of equal area and equal perimeter. And the cannon uh, or the cannons that we used um, included optimal transport, which we need for the existence of the uh, weighted Voronoi diagrams, and um, equivariant obstruction theory, which is an uh, um, important theory uh, in topology, but has, I think, never been used as concretely as I did that here in this lecture. I wanted to show you just more arrows before I stop. And the first thing is that you might notice if you go and use Google or whatever, that there is a paper around which um, attempts to prove um, the problem in general and says that this partition thing was previously known for prime powers. And in this paper, they discuss also higher dimensional versions, but they say they prove that this can be partitioned into M convex parts of equal area and equal perimeter for any integer M. That's the claim, not only for prime powers. This is the version on the archive where you can look at the preprint and you see that this has by now 11 versions between 2018 and 2023. So they've revised and revised the paper. It's still not published. Um, on the other hand, there's this paper from May of this year, which doesn't say so as explicitly, but essentially shows that the method by these other authors is wrong and cannot work. And so even though some people claim it, this partition problem is open. And indeed it is open for uh, n equals six. And um, I wouldn't know how to prove that you can divide even every triangle into six pieces of equal area and equal perimeter. And I'd be happy to see solutions. And that's still a different problem as um, then asking how you would compute such partitions. And uh, we don't know that also for n equals four or five. I think there's no efficient ways known to divide pieces into um, let's say triangles into n pieces of equal area and equal perimeter, even in the cases where the solutions exist. But that's already the next problem. I think I've given you enough problems up to now. Um, 
This is uh, the last slide nearly with greetings from Berlin with the logo of Freie Universität Berlin, Berlin Mathematical School, our graduate school and German Science Foundation, which funds lots of beautiful things. If you want to know what I had to fight about this summer, then this includes things like the logo of Freie Universität Berlin, where we made a new one, uh, which actually also changes and not everybody liked it. There was quite some fight about that, um, but that's university politics and not mathematics. So uh, we shouldn't talk about that today, perhaps. Uh, end of my lecture, thank you. Uh, thank you for uh, your beautiful talk, uh, Kunta. Uh, uh, you're an amazing mathematician and an amazing expositor. It's really a pleasure. Uh, Isra is uh, kicking off our freestyle uh, discussion section. Isra? Um, yeah, I had a quick question. So uh, I'm a big fan of proofs from the book, and I'm wondering if uh, you know or you have any recommendations about um, other books about cool problems and solutions that I should look into. Um, books of problems and solutions. Um... I I don't have an an, an immediate suggestion. Um, I could look around, but this is this is sort of my literature shelf. This is not mathematics books, as you could see from the from the colors of the book. Um, Maybe a related question, Günther. Uh, when you were our students' age, uh, say, also entering university, uh, beginning of your, your undergraduate studies, what was the book that inspired you most? Which book would you would you put under your pillow uh, when you go to bed? Okay. Um, I mean, the book that I have uh, next to my pillow in the... Uh, in the moment is not math books, but is again literature books that I don't have time. One of them is called The Creation of Jazz in Donbass, again by a Ukrainian author. Um, I don't know what the original uh, title is. Um, I got into math, um, what got me into math also as a high school student was indeed competitions. And so... Um, I did there's the German federal mathematics competition and all these things. And then I did the training for the International Math Olympiad. And it turns out that the, um, the professor who trained us at the time and taught us um, also made his training materials into a book, which is called Problem Solving Strategies by Arthur Engel um, from Frankfurt. Um, and that may be a, a recommendation, and it's also it's a, um, it's a book that's definitely our material and things that that inspired me me a lot, and um, and sort of got me got me hooked and got me into mathematics, and uh, so the the next two books that really. So I was an undergraduate student then in Munich, and then I went to MIT um, for a PhD. And at MIT, there's basically two books from there that are um, mathematics books that I really read from cover to cover. And I mean, that's what you usually don't do with math books. And uh, I definitely didn't, but this was Enumerative Combinatorics by Richard Stanley, volume one. Volume two was published much later. And the other one was Elements of Algebraic Topology by Jim Munkris, who was also a math professor at MIT. And that's uh, an amazing book also because it's very concrete where uh, people tend to be amazingly abstract in, in, in mathematics and certainly in areas like algebraic topology. And as you might guess, I... I love the concrete things and I have to make things concrete uh, in order to really 
understand things and work with them. And the this, the parts that I presented here are, um, uh, I mean, the hard work is in understanding things concretely, and then in um, in in um, seeing how you how how you can work with that. Maybe, uh, Günther, I can give some input. Uh, so I'm uh, reading a lot about optimal transport at the moment. Uh, and uh, in particular, Vilani's book is currently beside my pillow. Um, and uh, um, as much as I personally relish uh, in the amount of analysis uh, in the field, the proof of the theorem you quoted uh, is actually a consequence of Brouwer's theorem. So another result from algebraic topology. You can really get it from Brouwer's theorem. That's yeah. It's actually based on a theorem by von Neumann. Okay. Um, so uh, it's pretty well hidden. I don't even know if uh, uh, if Vilani um, addresses this in his book. <laughs> um there's one one interesting thing is that I mean I know that the theorem can be proven rather uh, rather elementarily mm -hmm. and there's a discrete version and you can really do it from linear programming mm -hmm. and if you read Vilani's book then he says he gives a reference and says that this can be uh, can be done uh, rather elementarily in a in a discrete setting but of course this is much more complicated <laughs> writes Vilani because he's he's not so on the discrete side of things. If you look at the reference he gives, it's a it's a paper by a guy called Evans from from Berkeley, mm -hmm. uh, which actually does a very beautiful exposition of and also proof of the Monge Kantorovich uh, theorem. However, it's beautiful. It's um, it's I think also very well explained. But it's not correct because he gets the the gets um, linear programming duality wrong. Oh, and no. there's later later corrections to that paper also by Evans, which which one really has to and has to take along. So he writes writes up the linear programs wrong um, in in his first published draft. So I, I posted a link to a paper by Keith Ball where he gives an elementary proof, but uh, it is based on. Um, I'm going to post. Another reference, but it's Brower. Brower at its heart. Okay. Uh, Polly. Uh, I have a question about uh, university where you're working because, uh, like, bigger part of uh, big students here are now choosing the university and um, you need to know what. Uh, we should understand and know for learning in some universities. And I have a question about language, on which language uh, uh, are lectures in the university where you work in? Um, in, in Berlin, uh, at all universities, basically undergraduate starting courses would be in German. But all advanced courses, master courses, and and so on are in English. Um, so we we changed that in um, uh, a few years ago when when we started Berlin Mathematical School in Berlin that and that all master courses and and everything is done done in English in um, at the three at the three Berlin universities. Um, I think to to sort of beginning courses in the in the first semesters tend to be in German in all subjects in in Germany. Um, however, um, I mean, there's one one observation is that um, that um, perhaps language is is not that much an an obstruction to mathematics uh, anywhere. So I. I know I, I needed so I did my 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 PhD studies in the US and I had to do that in English and it took me some time to somehow learn the necessary vocabulary but the vocabulary is is not that large uh, anyway 
And the one thing that stuck in the back of my mind is a remark by a Greek computer scientist from Berkeley who said the international language of science is broken English. And um, I think it's in, in mathematics and in other sciences, it's important to keep things simple in whatever language you're in. And there's no point in trying to be literature, uh, literary. And that also means it's no point in worrying too much about your language skills. And uh, indeed, there's sort of with some basic knowledge in a language, you can do mathematics. For other reasons, it's always good to learn languages, but um, but for math and, you know, math in German is not that complicated, actually, for that reason. Long answer for a short question. I hope it helps. Uh, Oleksii, please. Yeah, hi. I would like to ask, what do we know about this problem in higher dimensions? Um, good question. Um, one question is, what do you mean by that problem? Um, like, so, yeah. Or like... Um, or volume and the perimeter uh, analogs or yeah. like higher dimensions, I mean mm -hmm. that. So there's, there's several things to that and um, needs to be looked at. The first thing is um, in, so I, of course, I only gave you a sketch of a proof. Um, there is, a, there's several references that I can give. There is a, um, um, the paper is published in the in the Israel Journal of Mathematics, and there's also uh, I think a nice exposition that we did for the uh, newsletter of the um, of the European Math Society at some point. If you go, one thing you can see if you look at the proof is that it's never really used that we talk about the perimeter, and actually any function that is continuous if you change the partition continuously and that is equivariant so which if you permute the pieces you also permute the values works right so for example you could ask um the the circumradius or the diameter or whatever instead of the perimeter and then the proof is again true in the plane for n pieces of equal area and equal whatever you want. Right? And if you go to higher dimension, it turns out you get you can ask for more. Um, so if you go to the three-dimensional problem, you can say, I want to cut every three-dimensional body into n pieces of equal volume and equal something and equal other. So, um, and then it will be true for prime power number of pieces and unknown otherwise. Right, um, yeah, okay, thank you. And like, uh, maybe it's too late to ask this question, but how do we actually define a cut? How do we cut those? Uh, how do we cut that figure into a lot of small figures? Yeah. Um, I so, think like, I should they about... be should they be continuous? Should they be convex or? Um, so, uh, I think the convex is the important part. So, I would not talk about cuts, but I would me and talk about partitions you know, of, let's say, a three-dimensional body, or if you want a polytope into n convex pieces um, and partition means that they don't overlap so that they don't have volume in common um, and together they give you the whole body it's the okay, same thank you as in i think that i understand yeah and and again you you can partition um you can parameterize these uh, such partitions by 
by Voronoi cells. So again, you would look at n n distinct points in three space, and and these n distinct points have um, have unique weights to give you um, to give you a partition into uh, n pieces of equal volume. And then the question is, what extra things can you can you ask for there? Uh, thank you, Gunther. Uh, are there any other questions from the audience? Don't be shy. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, so then, in this uh, in this event, I think. Uh, it's uh, a good point uh, to call it a special lecture, uh, a special lecture by Günther Ziegler. Günther, it was uh, wonderful, a great pleasure. Thank you very much for, for taking time for us, for making time for us. And um, thank you. <laughs> good evening to Berlin. With great pleasure. Um, all the best wishes to to all of you, um, wherever you are, and thanks to Michael and Mitro to for setting this up. I think it's a wonderful format. I hope I could help. Thanks a lot. Bye. 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 Thank you. Goodbye.